the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And as I was just thinking of that just now, that we, we've had in this, in this last six months, we've passed from one earthly reign to another, from a very good and serving monarch to one that is yet to, I guess, show, show us what he's about. But even though that King Uzziah, who was a very good king, died, Isaiah got his eyes off this world and off the politics of this world. And he said, I, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And so our focus, our hope, our joy is in God himself. Hallelujah. And the one seated at his right hand, our Lord Yeshua. I want us to stand. And as we come into the worship of our great and awesome God, I know we don't often do this, but I want us to begin with what we used to call the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Just our voices. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.
so good to be in his house today. Hallelujah. And I'm so glad that Martha is with me. <laughs> I, I told him you're going to have to come and prove that you're still with us. <laughs> Amen. Well, let's meet and greet one another in the name of Yeshua. It's so good to see everyone here. Uh, make sure you see as many and greet as many as you can. Hey, how are you doing, guys? Good to see ya. Hi. Did you say be a pig? I don't blame you. Russell over there, you can give us a little wave, thank you. 
And we have our five kiddos. We have Josiah and Rebecca and Sammy and Benny. And Benny. And the newest addition, Illy, Ileana. Okay. <laughs> and, um, and Russell is in construction and I'm a homeschool mama. And so we, um, that is pretty great. It's pretty great. And um, so that is kind of our, our family. So we are happy to introduce ourselves to you guys. For those who don't know, you're always welcome to come and say hello. Mm -hmm. I love saying hi to people. Hello. <laughs> and um, you're welcome to say hi to any of us any time. Um, so we welcome the new people. And um, we, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about ourselves and um, how we came to um, the faith in Yeshua. So it's kind of a funny story. So I'm excited to tell you. So um, basically, my, my husband and I were both uh, going to school uh, in different programs. So I was going to school to become a teacher, and my husband was going uh, to school to become a computer programmer. And partly through both of our programs, and it was funny because my, um, my husband lived in Coquitlam, and I lived in Abbotsford. So we lived 45 minutes away. But we ended up meeting, uh, leaving our programs and going to Bethany Bible College in Hepburn, Saskatchewan. So even though we lived 45 minutes away, we ended up meeting each other <laughs> in Hepburn, Saskatchewan. And for those who don't know, uh, Bethany Bible College, it is, uh, or Hepburn, it is a town of 300 people, 150 who uh, go to the school, who are staff and, <laughs> staff and students at the school. So it's a very small little place, so it's quite quite God-ordained that we ended up meeting each other, so it's quite funny. Um, and yeah, so we ended up going to school and and we were just learning it. And I remember before I went there and I remember asking God, Lord, show me what's important to your heart and give me roots that last. I remember those two things so specifically. And when I went, I, I, you know, I was excited to learn. I'm like, I'm gonna learn all. And for some reason, I kind of thought we learned a lot about the Old Testament and we learned about, you know, what the Israelites would have thought, and we'd learn from you know Jewish understanding because I don't know. I just thought that's what I'd be learning because <laughs> they would know what was going on, right? And uh, so it was so funny. I remember being in my one class, and they started talking about uh, Noah's Ark, and they <laughs> and they were just telling different um, opinions of the way that Noah's Ark was. You know, thought of. And a lot of people said that, you know, Noah's Ark was just a loaf of blood. And for some reason, something rose up in me, and I was just really mad. And for those of you who know me, I don't get super mad <laughs> at a lot of things, but I was like, no, that, no, no, that doesn't make any sense. God, then God's lying, and the Bible does not lie. And I was just, I was just really upset. And I'm like, I need to find a rabbi. I need someone, I need to like, I'd be able to confirm this. This is no. And so, I went up to the secretary and I, and I said, you know, I need a rabbi. I need someone I can, you know, confirm this with, because this just doesn't make any sense to me. She kind of looked at me funny and sent me to, to the librarian and said, you might find your answer there. So I said, okay. So I went to the librarian and I said the same thing, I need a rabbi, I have some questions, and you know, they're going to know the answer. And she just kind of looked at me and said, well, what are you doing on Saturn? And I said, I think I'm free. And she's like, well, why don't you come down there? There's a bunch of people that... Uh, they might know what's you know what's going on and then they're able to answer your questions and I'm like all right let's do this so I went and it ended up being uh, my first suit coat and uh, and it was amazing and I was so overwhelmed we just we sat together in this huge group of people we had a wonderful time we just read the scriptures and we just talked about them and we asked questions and we just sat and it was just the most incredible time and I think I learned more than I've learned in church for years, and I had grown up in a Mennonite church, and um, and I was so blown away. I, I came back to the school, and I was telling everybody, including Russell, and we, we were friends at the time. I was telling everybody who would listen, "This is amazing." And what about this? And you guys thought about the festivals, and I was telling everybody, and they're all like, "What is wrong with you?" And I'm like, "This is so cool. I mean, haven't you guys heard about this? This is so exciting. This is so incredible. Like, there's so much more we haven't even heard, and we've all been reading the same Bible." Like, this is so incredible. And, you know, my husband, my, my now husband, was like, what is this girl into? And so he started researching because, you know, he had to prove me wrong, of course, so that, you know, I wouldn't go down this crazy rabbit hole. And um, he's like, 
I can't prove her wrong. This is this is just, this, this is just in the Bible. All of this is in the Bible. You know, I, and he went more hardcore than I did. And thus our story began, and we ended up going on this adventure. And um, long story short, we are here, and we are thankful for all of you. And um, we are so thankful that we've gone to see a piece of God's heart and just got to know him more through all of this and to know all of you and that we have a wonderful, wonderful family. I know a lot of people in this, this journey, they sometimes go without a family for a while and I think it's so that we appreciate the family that we get when we get it. And it's, it's just a really big blessing to have all of you and we're just excited to be part of this family and we're excited for all the future adventures that may come before us. And bless you. And um, so don't be surprised if you get a call from me. I'll, you know, I'll give you a week or two notice and or <laughs> request, not notice, <laughs> but a request, a summons. And uh, you know, if you only if you want to, of course, but to share some of your stories so that we can get to know one another. Children, you've been so good. Now you can gather here. There we go. <laughs> Yeah, there is a lot. That's wonderful. Well, let's let's all stretch our hands toward these wonderful treasures, precious treasures that God has given us. Heavenly Father, in the name of Yeshua, I pray for these children, boys and girls and young people. And Lord, I pray that your blessing be upon them and help them to learn much of you today. Be with our teachers. And thank you that our teachers are here. Thank you for Teacher Marta that she's back. And we pray your blessing upon each and every class and each and every one. In the name of Yeshua. And God's people said, Amen. 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 I thank all the teachers who taught when I was sick. And not just teachers, but all who set up the classes and did all the work. Thank you. Look what the Lord has done. Marvelous <laughs> The Lord's doing it's marvelous in our eyes. Amen. Well, today we're going to kind of take a survey of a few chapters of the Parashah reading. Uh, Exodus 18, 19, and 20. We're going to get to the Ten Commandments, but when we get to the Ten Commandments, that's going to be kind of your part of the message. And so in preparing for that, I'm giving you a bit of a half hour's notice what the Midrash will be. Uh, I want you to think of, of one of the Ten Commandments uh, that gives you the most freedom. Okay, that's, that's your assignment. Now, you have to listen to the message while you're thinking about that. I hope you can do two things at the same time. But uh, when we get to the Midrash, it will be, what ten, what, which one of the Ten Commandments in your life has given you the most freedom? Amen. Amen. So, this message today, I've entitled, Sentinels of Freedom. It's ways, doors, paths, heights, summits of experiencing God's truth. Beacons that draw our attention to the spiritual and the divine. I believe it was last week that I mentioned the uh, history lesson of the Spanish Armada that was coming up the coast of, of France and then toward England. And as they saw the ships, these great huge uh, ships from Spain uh, with their great masts on the horizon, they started to light beacons on the coast of England. And one beacon from one high point and then another beacon was lit as they saw that one to another high point and then another beacon to another high point so that all of England would know that they were about to engage the enemy. But praise God, God blew that wind and the Inquisition did not come uh, to England. Hallelujah. And we're here to tell the tale, I'm telling you, today because of that. But we have sentinels, we have high fortresses, high lookouts for the light of God to shine on our pathway. And 
I'm just thinking of how we encounter the divine, how we encounter what is spiritual. And when we think about how we came to faith in Yeshua, how we came to understand, to believe, to even comprehend or begin to comprehend these things of God, of faith. And it's not so much perhaps that we read it in the scriptures, but that we heard it first. If you think of how you came to faith and even, even the first time that you were introduced to it, it was in your hearing. And one of the first things that we come to is encountering servant leaders who are faithful in witnessing, in teaching, yes, and in preaching, but in speaking forth the word of truth. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Paul says in his epistles in Corinthians, he says, you are letters read of all men. Did you know that you are sometimes maybe the only Bible someone will ever read? And we need to remember that we are the conduit, we are the communique, the communication of God's truth. And so as we encounter servant leaders, we hear the gospel, as long as they are speaking the gospel in true uh, faith. We're going to see three, three um, summits, three sentinels of freedom today, servant leaders, our sovereign Lord himself, and the supreme law of love. When we come to Exodus 18, we find that Moses meets with Jethro, his father-in-law, in the desert of Midian. Now I know that in many of our Bibles, in the, on the back pages, they have maps of where Sinai is, and they place it in the Sinai Peninsula. The only problem is, is that that was not where Midian had its kingdom. That's not where Midian, the tribe of Midian, or the nation of Midian lived. They lived more down into Saudi Arabia. In fact, when Paul says that he went down to the mountain of God, he says he went down to Arabia. And so it's probably more in Saudi Arabia. And someday, and I don't think it's up to us to make it happen, but someday when Messiah comes, he's going to let... Israel in on all that oil that's under Saudi Arabia because every place where their foot has trod he's going to give but that's up to him to do amen so Jethro who's called the priest of Midian comes out he's Moses father-in-law and he comes to Moses with Moses wife and his children and I would think that Moses, when he was called of God at the burning bush and told, now you go down to Egypt and you are going to deliver my people, I believe that that's when he left his wife and his children with uh, her father, Jethro, and then he went down to Egypt to be the deliverer of the people of God. But here we have the servant leader who is Moses. And when Jethro comes along, his father-in-law brings the family back with him, and he is called the priest of Midian. Now, where did Jethro and Midian come from? Well, after, after Sarah had passed away, uh, Avraham had married Keturah, and one of the children or one of the tribes coming out of that was um, Midian. So they were actually kin, they were cousins, as it were. And so Jethro comes out, and Moses tells him of all the things that had happened to Pharaoh and the parting of the Red Sea and all the plagues and to bring about such a glorification of Almighty God. Moses never drew attention to himself. When you have heard the gospel, whether it's from uh, in our past a Sunday school teacher or a Shabbat school teacher, or a parent or a grandparent or someone in an assembly and you've heard the gospel I trust that you heard it from someone who is truly a servant leader when I don't know if you've ever been to an art exhibition or an art auction and they bring out these beautiful paintings and you have to be careful not to twitch or else you might buy one unbeknownst to you but these beautiful paintings now, does the art dealer stand in front of the painting and say, How, who will bid on this painting? 
Does he stand in front of it like that? No, he stands to the side because he wants you to gaze on the painting, not on himself. He's just the facilitator of the meeting. But what you really want to do is look at that painting. When you hold something up and you want people to see it, they might see the edges of your fingertips, but what they see should be the Word of God, should be what you are presenting, should be Yeshua himself. May Yeshua be seen more than the one who speaks of Yeshua. May Yeshua be the center of our attention. And so we have this sentinel of freedom. Yes, we come, first of all, to, into the hearing of who God is. And I trust that it has been a servant leader. Moses goes out to meet his father-in-law, bows down and kisses him. And here Moses is this great deliverer, this leader of the nation of millions of people. And here he comes and he honors his father-in-law. He honors the grandfather of his children. It's so important that we give honor to whom honor is due. It's so important that we understand that the people around us are so precious to us. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad that Danielle was able to share her story today. Because I, I think we don't, we underestimate or maybe we don't even estimate at all who it is that belongs or who it is that is part of our congregation. And as a, a shepherd, as an under shepherd in this assembly, I want you to know that I will, I will defend every sheep in this pasture. This is his pasture, the sheep of his wonderful pasture. And so thank you, Danielle, for sharing with us today. When Jethro heard all that God had done, he says, now I know that yod is greater than all the gods. They had heard of other so-called gods. They may even thought, well, you know, those must be something. But he now knows that there is but one God who is great, who is like unto thee, O Lord, among gods. As Moses continues in his ministry and his servant leadership, Jethro notices something. He notices that from the sunrise to sunset, what's Moses doing? Judging the people. And can you imagine millions of people in the desert and somebody says, well, your tent's a little bit too close to my tent. You know, that's, that's my property line. And you're just over it a little bit too much. And others might say, well, you know, we went out and I saw so-and-so gather more manna than, than what, what they, they should have, you know. And all these, I don't know, what accusations they might have had or, or problems. And so he sat there all day long, judging, judging, judging. And what did his father-in-law say? What you are doing is not good. You're wearing yourself out. And so he charges... Moses, who's the servant leader, see, Moses had this such a servant's heart. He was willing to help each and every one in his million-plus congregation. He wanted to help and be that servant. And But in order to be a good servant, you also have to be a good leader. You have to be a good manager, a good one that will, will take the time that God truly gives. And so Jethro advises... Uh, verses 18 to 20 of, of Exodus 18, I will give you counsel and God will be with you. Stand before God for the people so that you may bring the difficulties to God. And you shall teach them the statutes of the law and show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do. Let's have a meeting. Have you ever, I know you've been to church. I know you've been to uh, different conferences. But have you ever been to a meeting? Now that's different. How many of you know what a meeting is? Alan, you know what a meeting is. <laughs> when when you're, you're actually speaking the words of God and giving the truth of God to the people and they are with you. They are saying amen and hallelujah and yes. And they're in agreement with you. I could use a few nods right now. Okay. <laughs> they're in agreement with you. And what Jethro is saying is, you know, rather than teach each one or each small group individually, bring them together and teach them the law, the Torah, the instructions of God. 
there were a number of people that, over my 40 years of ministry, there were a number of people that said, can you give us counsel? And I said, well, I noticed that your, your attendance is a little spotty. Why don't you come to the services? And they said, well, I don't... I don't know if I, if I have time for that. I don't know if, if you know, I, I want personal counsel. I said, did you know that over 90% of what I would have to tell you, you could hear at the service, at the meeting? If you would take hold of the Word of God and what is preached, what is taught, you would, you know, that would solve a number of issues. Amen. So Jethro gives Moses the same counsel. You teach the people. They need to, yes, they need to know what's right and what's wrong and how to how to manage with one another. But you could teach that to the whole of the group, whole of the assembly, and counsel them that way. So that was one thing. Moses was this servant leader. He was the one that they were waiting on to hear God's truth, God's word. He was recognized as the true leader, and, and he was pointing not to himself, but to the Almighty. The leader cannot do the work of leadership alone. We have a special responsibility for prayer and teaching, but to train and to give authority for those that will do the work. And let the people, you know, the people have ministry. You have ministries. And I don't think your ministry is to sit in a pew every week. I don't. I think that's important, but I don't think that's your main ministry. Mm -hmm. well, wait, is there anyone to say amen? Amen. amen. <laughs> is that your main ministry to sit and and no? It's not just blessed assurance. I hope you caught that. Anyway, <laughs> someone did. <laughs> so Jethro advises Moses to delegate the responsibility in resolving disputes and there is to be for uh, hundreds for fifties and so on and then the hardest cases should be brought to Moses himself select selecting people of ability people of capability people who have capacity themselves to learn people of godliness people who fear the Lord people who know the Word of God and are people of integrity and truth, people of honor, people that hate what, God's, what God hates and loves what God loves. In other words, to know the heart of God. Paul gave this counsel to Timothy, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. I'm excited over these next, I'll say, five to seven years, and there, I, because we, we're in a time of transition, um, and I'm not, I'm, I don't know what the Lord will have for me in the next five to seven years, God willing, but there's going to be transition. And I believe that God wants this congregation to continue. Now, I'm not resigning today. I'm not retiring today, but we have to think. Mm -hmm. Five years down the line, uh, six, seven, eight, if the Lord tarries, and if I tarry. <laughs> but, you know, here's transition. We need to be thinking about how God, what God wants to do with this congregation. And that's exciting. That is something to celebrate, that God wants to see this congregation continue to the day of Yeshua. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And that's part of our responsibility. And so, as Moses is told of these things, there is good result. The people are more peaceful. The people then have something that they, they're connecting to the ones that are judging them. And Moses does what Jethro has asked him to do. And so we, when we're encountering the divine, encountering the spiritual, we encounter people. We encounter pastors and teachers and missionaries. All too often, these in leadership are so concerned about their own selves, their own reputation, their own uh, popularity, their own fame. That's not the kind of servant leader that God wants. You know, I'm so glad we don't have a hierarchy. You know, in some congregations, in some groups, they have, you know, you start out as a, I, 
I, when I was in Unity, Saskatchewan, there, the Anglican fellow, he was a canon. I was always looking for the boom. Where's the boom? But anyway, he was a canon. He was the reverend canon. I never knew what that was. I didn't know if that was above or below a deacon. But anyway, there was deacon and canon. And then there was vicar. And then there was uh, something else. <laughs> and then a bishop. And then an archbishop. And then I guess I guess Canterbury was next or whatever. There was just a whole hierarchy. When I was first come to Abbotsford, I received a phone call from uh, the uh, Catholic seminary in Mission. And they asked me if I would come and teach a class. And I was quite surprised. I thought, well, you know, why would you why would you phone? But they I guess they, they were looking for a Baptist minister. And so they started with the A's, and Abbotsford Baptist must have been the first in the phone book or something. So they phoned up Abbotsford Baptist AB, and they came up with Archibald. <laughs> and, okay, come and teach a class at the Catholic seminary. And I'll tell you this, the Lord had to deal with my heart. Because I was, I was not exactly, not without prejudice, I'll put it that way. And I thought, I have nothing to, you know, that I have nothing in common with them. What what would I teach them? Um, you know, I, I was just, I was very, uh, you know, whatever, too proud. And the Lord spoke to my heart. And he, he asked me a question. What do you have in common with the Catholics? And I immediately said, nothing. <laughs> I said, no, no, think. What do you have in common? Okay. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's something we have in common. Um, and, and there is a few other things. Uh, a high view of Scripture and other things. And so I accepted the challenge. And when I got to that class, here were all these, um, you know, uh, these seminarians, and they already had their backwards collar and the whole, whole nine yards. And I said, you've asked me to come and teach what is the difference between Baptists and Catholics? And I'm going to begin this class with what do we have in common? Mm -hmm. And for about 20 or 30 minutes, we spoke of the things that we held in common. And it broke, I, I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit descended into that classroom. And that, that kind of surprised me because I didn't think the Holy Spirit had anything to do with him. But anyway, but he descended into that classroom. And they, and they were so willing to hear, so what is it that you believe that's different from us? And it wasn't, it, it was done in such a lovely way. I, I'll never forget it. And then they, they asked about the hierarchy. Because they said, well, we have archbishops, and, well, pope and archbishops and bishops and cardinals and all that. What do you have? And I asked, <laughs> you know, I wasn't thinking because they all took a vow of poverty, but I asked, said, how many of you have some coins? And I don't know that any of them had any coins on them, but I had a few coins. And I laid out the coins. And there were uh, loonies and toonies and quarters and dimes and nickels and things, pennies even at the time. And I laid them out. And I said, what do you, when you see this, what do you see? Well, there, it's all flat. I said, yeah, it's all flat. Now, now these coins can touch each other. These coins can add together and add up to something or, or subtract or things. But these coins are all on one flat table. And I said, that's how evangelicals are. We're all, this, all on one level. There's no one greater, no one less. We're all on the same level bought by the blood of the Lamb. Amen, amen, amen. And I was able to share. And they had asked. They had asked. So how, you know, how does this work? And they were, I, I think we all learned something that evening at that class. But we encounter servant leaders. Mm -hmm. I trust that who, wherever you go, that you will be that servant leader to others, that you will be the communication to others, because that's perhaps the first time they will see the gospel in the flesh, as it were. Hallelujah. That's the sentinel of freedom. The second one we find in Exodus 19, when the nation of Israel comes to Mount Sinai itself, and after a time in the wilderness, 
and having received water and food and so on, here they come to this Mount Sinai. When we think of wilderness, we think of just desert sand. But wilderness can have some uh, vegetation as well. And uh, especially when you think that they had cows and sheep and so on, they had to eat something. So there was that for them. But here they were coming to the mountain of God, Mount Sinai. And again, it's probably the mountain in Saudi Arabia. There is a mountain there that looks today, even looks scorched at the top. And that is probably the site of Sinai, of the true Sinai. Now God reminds Israel as they come to him of his great power and care for them. You saw what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Verses 3 and 4 of chapter 19 of Exodus. And so when Moses and the children of Israel go up and God calls Moses up into the mountain and he speaks to Moses audibly and directly, what a deliverance is, is this that the children of Israel have experienced. And he reveals his purpose and plan for Israel. Verses 5 and 6 of 19, of Exodus 19. Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you will be a special treasure to me above all people. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak to the children of Israel. And here they come to this holy mountain of God, full of thunderings and lightnings and all the things. And remember that they could only come so, so close because of the holiness of that place. And what does God declare? You are a special treasure to me. Isn't that wonderful? That even in that great, awesome, shock and awe kind of environment, you are a special treasure to me. You, are, you will be a kingdom of a priest, a holy nation. This is the purpose and plan of God. And not just for Israel, but for all whom God will call mm -hmm. to his name. Yes, we come. You know, people sometimes have a hard time even coming into an assembly, into a church building. Some people will say, I'm afraid to go into church because I'm afraid that God will what? <laughs> Strike me dead. <laughs> They're afraid because of all the things. They... You know, people know that they're condemned. People know because uh, they've condemned, their own hearts have condemned them. They need to know that God has a plan and purpose for them and that they are a wonderful treasure to Him. If we keep beating people over the head for the things they already know they've done, they already feel bad enough. The Son of God did not come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. We have a message of deliverance, of salvation. Now we're having a meeting. A message of salvation and deliverance. You will be a royal priesthood. You will be a holy nation. You will be what God has determined and has called you to be. Hallelujah. I have a question for you this, this afternoon. This morning somewhere in New Zealand, but this afternoon. <laughs> How much did you put into your own being? In other words, how did you ever get to be? And I don't want too much graphic, but <laughs> how, how much did effort did you put into it? Well, there was mom and there was dad, and you must have put at least 33%, a third of it, didn't you? Zero. Zero. You never asked to be born. You never asked to exist. And yet you do. And your parents love you and loved you and love you still. Your parents did everything for you to bring you into this world and to set you on the right path to the Lord. And here is God's plan and purpose for you. And God gives them who he is. And what he's, and he says, this is what I'm, I'm going to have you be. And before he even begins to tell them anything of the expectation on them, they say, all that you say we will do. They're willing to do anything. Now, 
their testimony and their words are a little bit ahead of their experience. You know, there's no, what is it? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. They had a willingness, but it wasn't long until they showed that their heart was still far from God. He commands that His holy presence be respected. He commands for ceremonial purity and cleanliness. You know, it's an interesting thing when we invite people to, to the cross, when we invite them to faith in Yeshua. Often people will say, I'm not good enough. Wait till I, I clean myself up. Isn't that what some people say? I need to clean myself up. You know, that's... <laughs> well, okay. How many of you have, you have ever hired a maid service and cleaned the house before the maid service got there? <laughs> Be honest. <laughs> you know... Uh, we, we're embarrassed. We think, oh, I, you know, I just need to clean myself up in order for God to accept me. But here's the freedom. This great, awesome, shock and awe, reverent God that we are to absolutely revere will clean us up. Come. And even though there was a separation, he still invited them to come as close as they could as close as was possible at that time. Thunderings and lightnings. And this, when the sound of the trumpet happens, you, you, you bring the people. And even though there was a barrier at that time, God still had the invitation. I'm moving ahead here. Yeah, because in Hebrews, it tells us that we have not come to just to Mount Sinai, but now we have come to the mountain of God, Mount Zion, Mount Zion. It's interesting that at Mount Sinai, the, the law was given. God was shown to be holy and awesome, to be reverenced. Yeshua dies on that hillside, Mount Calvary, Golgotha, the place of the skull. And he draws us to that place and then says that Mount Zion is open and free. Hallelujah, we come to a mountain that is not smoking anymore. We come to this Mount Zion, the scripture tells us in Hebrews. Zion, or Sinai, the people were terrified. Zion, we are forgiven. Sinai was in a dry desert. Zion is a city of the living God and whose trees are in blossom every month of the year. Sinai had fear and, and earthly in, earthly uh, fear Mount Zion, Zion the heavenly and the spiritual at Sinai only Moses actually ascended Mount Sinai Mount Zion it, there is an innumerable company of, of people Sinai the guilty were there Zion are the guilty made justified Moses is the mediator at Sinai. Yeshua is the mediator at Sinai. But here we have this sentinel of freedom, God himself. The first sentinel of freedom we encounter are people. Bibles that are read in their lives. That people telling others, one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. And then we bring them to understand that there is this great and awesome creator, God, who has a wonderful purpose and plan for their life. But he is completely holy. And what is the solution to bring us from being where we are separated from God to in his presence, to be in his presence? What is the solution to that? You. Yeshua himself, the blood of the cross. Hallelujah. So we encounter servant leaders, we encounter the sovereign Lord uh, and see in him a, a sentinel a tower of freedom. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. What a sentinel of freedom. Now it's your turn to do a little preaching. I asked you at the beginning of this message to think of, a, of one of the Ten Commandments that offers you so much freedom. And it, for one, it can be one command for another. It can, and for some, oh, I can't choose. It's all ten. <laughs> and then, you're already at the conclusion. But anyway, what, what, of the commandments, which of the commandments gives you a lot of freedom? 
Anyway, Ron, you're, four. you're number four? Yes. Mm -hmm. And quote it. Honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. I don't, when, I first, when we first began keeping Sabbath, we thought we were walking into, when we first started keeping Sabbath, we thought we were walking into obligations and, and <laughs> burdens. And we had friends from our old church that we met at a funeral afterwards, and one of them sidled up to me and said, are you still saved? <laughs> but what we found, in fact, when we stepped through that doorway of the Sabbath, we stepped into a wide, free place. There was great freedom in, in keeping God's Sabbath and keeping it holy and honoring Him by keeping it when we're talking about the Ten Commandments, I'm talking about the supreme law of love. <coughs> love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Anyone else? One of the Ten Commandments that gives you such freedom. <coughs> yes, Michael, at the back. Well, I have to say, being raised as a Roman Catholic, <laughs> uh, all of them set me free. So yes. Um, yes. I say all of them because uh, the Word <laughs> set me free. And, me, you know, away from bondage, um, all the Ten Commandments to me took me away from everything that I was in. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is really no one favorite one. Um, maybe that shall not steal, because I always stole all my life. Let him who stole steal no more. Amen. Yeah, <laughs> I, uh, I just want to ask, um, I, I shouldn't be preaching because this is your turn, but anyway. Um, what was, what's the first commandment in the scriptures in Genesis? What's the first commandment? In Genesis. Gen think of Genesis 1, 1, 2. What's the first commandment you can say? Be fruitful and multiply. It's not thou shalt not eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge. It's be fruitful and multiply. Amen. The second commandment. Okay. Places man in the garden to tend it. Tend the garden. Third commandment, what was Adam to do? Name the animals. See, you, you, he had wonderful, wonderful things that God gave him to do. Air, and even, you, fourth one, you may eat of all the trees of the garden, except for one, but you may eat of any of the trees, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not. Before you get to a thou shalt not, there are so many, you know, wonderful things that God asks Adam and Eve to do. It's not all negative. <laughs> Amen. Anyone else? Ten commandments that sets you free. Yes, Gabriella. For me, it was also uh, about not making any graven images because I grew up Roman Catholic and that commandment doesn't even exist mm -hmm. when you learn the Ten Commandments. Yeah. Uh, so it was a start to start reading the Bible because I felt they lied to me. Mm -hmm. If they can even lie about the Ten Commandments, what else? Yeah. So it was a start of freedom and then just like Ron said, some years later, it was about keeping the Sabbath because that was opening another, uh, again, we thought it's a burden and the law is for mm -hmm. all. <laughs> and the Shabbat was just a start of learning that God's commandments are mm -hmm. wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. 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 Um, was there anyone else that was okay? I, I had to. I had to share. I'm trying not to, but I have to. <laughs> <laughs> um, so growing up, I, when I was eight, I disowned my mother because of a lot of trauma, and <clears throat> I was overtaken by hatred and rage for her. So I didn't know what to do, how to handle it. And then, um, when I became a Christian, um, and I left the Lord, 
But this anger and this, this bitterness against my mother just wouldn't go. And it tormented me. I did not know how to ever um, get released from it. And then one day, I was telling a friend about this, and I'd been in Buddhism for quite a long time. And my friend said to me, um, let's just pray. I, if you confess your thoughts one to another, it had been a secret sin. And so I confessed it to her, and then she prayed for me. And, and, and as she prayed for me, there was this explosion of God's glory and love right. and peace that just over, well, it was so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And for three months, I walked in such a light of God's love mm -hmm. and comfort and presence. And he truly set me free. Amen. So, only your mother and father that may go on with you. Amen. That will go well with you. Amen. Amen. Yes, right. Well, uh, well, actually the same as um, her as well, like the honor of your father and mother. Because, you know, uh, when I was, before I was born again, I was very hateful. I hated my parents. I was raised Roman Catholic, but I, I was religious, I was an altar boy, but I did not want to do it. I was an agnostic, I was I hated myself, I was angry at everyone and everything, so I would not care what my parents would say or and then it, you know, when I was born again, it set me free because it's something that a classmate preached on the Ten Commandments and one of them were that I don't know, to me Personally, it, uh, when he preached the gospel and the Ten Commandments and the Kingdom of God, repenting, I was like, well, I, um, that commandment really hit me because I was like, I wanted to be free, but I was like, I don't know how, you know, I wanted to be not angry anymore. <laughs> but I kept on being angry all the time <laughs> to my parents. Um, so, I mean, all of them are really um, good, like, they're all holy commandments, but that one is also, that helped me in my salvation. Um, and because I, and my siblings also did like me because I was angry at them too, so. Um, um, so it made me whole, uh, set me free to serve. And you know, my name, <laughs> It means something like a servant leader kind of thing, mm -hmm. servant king. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> that was like, you know, oh wow! So that was a good revelation. And, like I knew the meaning like a little bit later on, not right away. But, so yeah, it's the first commandment of promise. So yes. it's like that also hit me as well. I was like, oh, so uh, I want to honor my parents and. Uh, yeah, just, yeah, that's the change me. <laughs> yeah, amen. You know, you, you cannot truly give forth the gospel without also giving forth these are the things. Yes, there are requirements, but when you add it and mix it with faith and grace, did you know that the Ten Commandments become Ten Promises? Because if you come at it as a have to and an obligation, thou shalt not, thou shalt not steal, okay? God changes you, all of a sudden, I don't want to steal. <laughs> thou shalt not, and you, you will not steal. You will not kill. You will not, you know, covet. You will honor the Sabbath. You will do this. You know, it the commandments become freedom become freedom promises and they become a principle within of grace of the grace of God so these are the sentinels of freedom that I wanted to focus on today I know it's, it's, it was a lot of chapters 18 19 and 20 of Exodus we encounter the divine when we encounter servant leaders be the person be the scriptures for people that they can see 
that there is a gospel of grace, a gospel of truth. We encounter the sovereign God. We come to Mount Sinai. We come to this awesome, reverenced God. And then we find out that He wants a relationship with us. And that can be a surprise and a shock to us. And we find that there is an invitation. And then we encounter the supreme law of love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. And we find out that this thing that God has given us is actually His loving heart. Mm -hmm. And let us be free. Let us walk freely in both law and grace and realize that the law is a very gracious thing because it's brought us to Almighty God. Amen. 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 I'm going to ask our brother Ron. Um, Ron has agreed from time to time to uh, grace us with the ironic blessing as God gives you breath. Amen. Amen. Let us stand. Yeva Rekka, Yehova, Veshmarekha, Yael, Yehova, Hanavaleka, Vekneka, Yisha. I want to also think of our brother Claude, who's in palliative care, that the blessing of God rest on him as well. And Michael, if you will relay that to our brother. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give to you his shalom.